Hello everyone, thanks for joining. Um, my name is Fjold Kady, I'm a senior data scientist at ThinkBig, and this talk is Relational Algebra and the Pig Language. Um, first off, I'd like to thank ThinkBig for hosting the webinar. I'd also like to thank my colleague, Daniel Eklund, uh, for originally sparking my interest in this subject and also for letting me borrow some of his slides. So, my goal in this webinar is to give you a flavor for relational programming. Um, I'll talk of, first I'll talk about the pig language, which is a modern Hadoop-based language that more or less follows the relational paradigm. I won't cover every detail of pig, but I will cover sort of the relational core. Um, I'll talk about relational algebra, the mathematical theory, which is the theoretical framework behind pig and other relational languages like SQL. And finally, I'll talk about not just you know the theory or the syntax of languages, but how this gets implemented in the pig language in particular. There's a lot of different implementations of relational algebra out there which look very different. But I want to at least you know get the mental juices flowing by showing you uh, one particular example of how relational programming is implemented. Now that covers a lot of ground. Um, so it'll be a relatively superficial treatment, but I want to show you how these different parts all connect to each other. So first, a little bit of uh, historical background. Relational algebra was developed in the 60s and 70s by Cod as a, a mathematical formalism for how to query a database. It was you know, largely based on first order logic, uh, and it was de designed to answer one single query lightning fast. Uh, and it caught on like wildfire, um, SQL being by far the most popular language in use today. Um, and for a while, relational programming was basically a domain-specific language. If you were doing database management, you were doing relational coding and vice versa for the most part. But if you fast forward to the present, uh, on the one hand, relational programming is under attack. Uh, the NoSQL movement is pushing for databases that are not relational, you know, things like Bigtable and HBase. On the other hand, uh, relational programming is getting into new territory. PIG, the language that I will be talking about in this uh, webinar, is nothing like SQL in the envisioned use cases. It's a, it's a batch processing language that you know, can run uh, a job for hours but crunch through huge amounts of data and produce many different pieces of output. So what we're seeing is relational programming has gone from being a domain-specific paradigm to a more sort of general way of approaching programming problems, and in particular, uh, approaching programming problems that are very data-centric. So as I mentioned, I cover a lot of ground in this uh, talk. So I'm going to talk about you know, the core of the pig language, some of the theoretical aspects of relational algebra, and a little bit of a flavor of MapReduce. But I'm not going to be proving theorems. Uh, I might be stating results, though. Uh, I will not cover all details of the pig language, and I definitely won't dive much into the details of Hadoop. Um, so without further ado, let's jump into the, the syntax of the pig language. Uh, pig was developed at Yahoo. It's designed for cluster computing, you know, huge batch jobs running for, you know, potentially several hours across, you know, possibly thousands of machines. Um, the syntax of pig is more or less relational programming. Um, there are variants in relational programming. One of my goals is to show you some of the different variants that occur. Um, for now, let's just focus on the syntax of PIG, not on you know, what, it, what the implementation looks like or what's you know, going on when it's running. I'm trying to sort of isolate the, the core programming concepts. So here's a problem that you might solve using relational algebra. You've got two inputs. There's a table giving the titles of books and their ISBN numbers. Then there's another table giving uh, the ISBN numbers of books and an author who, wrote, who worked on them. 
Uh, in general, several authors might have worked on a given book, and in general, one author might have written many books. And what we want to output is a table that says, for each book title, how many authors worked on it. Um, for comparison's sake, here's how you might solve that problem in SQL. You can see that you have to do a join on the two tables, um, and then group the joined rows by the title, and then for each title you count the number of rows, and that gives you the full number of authors. Uh, for comparison now, here is the same code in PIG. You aren't expected to completely understand uh, this code, of course. I'll get, I'll walk you through it and explain what the different parts mean. But you can see right up front, PIG is much more explicit about breaking the computation into steps. Um, you load each data set and note that you declare the schema, you know, the column titles, when you are loading it. Uh, then the join happens and there's a new table that is created that's just the join of the original two. Then the grouping happens and then you pull out the title and the number of authors. Uh, so it's many different steps as opposed to SQL which lumps it all into one big query. So let's take a look at what we've got going on here. Um, I'll start by introducing the data types that you see in PIG. Um, everything you ever declare is a relation. Um, a relation is basically a table, like a spreadsheet with uh, unordered rows and columns, which generally are named. So when I've loaded these data sets uh, from memory, I load them as relations and I say what the, co what the column names are when I load them. You can have you know, your familiar data types like integers and floats and strings, but you can only have them as entries in a relation. Basically everything to the left side of an equal sign is going to be one of these relations. The next uh, data type is tuples. and A tuple in pig means what it means anywhere else, just an ordered set of values. They can be integers, they can be strings, they can also be uh, nested. You can have you know, the second element of a tuple be another tuple, which is what I'm showing in the, uh, second, in the second example on this slide. You might have noticed the rows in a relation are basically tuples, and really that is how they're implemented under the hood. So when I say that a relation is an unordered set of rows, I, I could equally well have said it's an unordered combination of tuples. So this is probably so far so good. I expect everyone has probably seen relations. If, if not, they're fairly familiar. And tuples are very straightforward. Here, at least for me, is where it gets a little bit tricky. This weirded me out when I first saw it. Um, a tuple can have anything in it. You can have an integer. You can have another tuple. You can also have an element of a tuple be a whole other relation. Uh, in that context we refer to it as a bag. Um, so anything you ever declare is a relation and a relation is just a collection of tuples and the entries in those tuples can be anything including tuples and whole other relations. Um, now here's the core pig operators uh, which which process these relations to generate other relations. Uh, some of them you saw in the code earlier. And I'll go, them, I'll go through them one by one. The most basic operator is probably the for each generate. It lets you, uh, the, the, the input is a relation, in this case, uh, book auth, and you declare which columns should be kept from book auth, possibly renaming them, and you can define new columns at this time. Uh, so here I am selecting out the name column and renaming it author and then creating a new column that happens to be a function of the name column and naming it bar. You can see here authors is the output. It's fairly straightforward. A for each generate is really, you can think of it as a function that takes in a tuple in the original relation 
and outputs a tuple in the new relation. So note, for every tuple in the original one, you get a tuple in the new one. If you want to remove tuples, then you use the filter operation. Um, this can't change the values of any rows. Uh, it just lets you uh, narrow a relation down to those that satisfy this particular predicate. In this case, you know, the name being Asimov. Union is another straightforward operation. Um, it lets you take two relations and just combine their uh, tuples into one. Uh, it's okay if there's duplicates. Pig is fine with duplication of uh, rows. The one caveat to using union is you have to have the two inputted relations have the same schema. Now here's where it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, here's the, the code that we wrote said combined equals join book by ISBN and book auth by ISBN. What that means is it will look through this book relation at the ISBN column and through the book auth relation at the ISBN column. And whenever there are two matching rows, those the tuples there will be concatenated into one tuple in the output relation. And a row in book could match many rows in book auth. It could match only one. It could match none. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of ways that could turn out, but the output will co will contain every pair of tuples that match and concatenate them. And note that the column orders in the combined relation are just the concatenated names of the columns from the original two, except that pig uh, prepends to those column to those column names the name of the original relation they came from. Now here's a relate. Now here is the operation that lets us generate that funky relation nested in a relation thing. It's grouping. Uh, the relation on the left here is pretty plain vanilla. It's got three columns, and they're all integers or strings. When we say to group it by title, though, the output has two columns. Uh, the first column uh, will give a title that was in the original column. Note that our foundation occurs twice in the original relation. Um, and there are two distinct titles in the original relation. That means two distinct rows in this uh, grouped relation. The second column contains a bag. And that bag is, the bag for foundation, for example, is every tuple in the original relation that had the title being foundation. And if you look at the uh, two relations contained in this column, if you combine them, you just reproduce the original relation. So we're, we're basically taking the uh, title column, finding its distinct values, and then splitting up those tuples according to the value. And finally, the flatten operation is just the reverse of this funky group thing. Um, I told you earlier that a for each generate takes in a row in the original relation and outputs a new row. If you're flattening it, it can output multiple rows. Um, so it's, it, it's really just the inverse of uh, the group operation. So to recap, the core operations in PIG are for each generate, which lets you, you know, select and add new columns. Filter, which lets you throw out rows. Union, which lets you combine two relations. Join, which matches up, uh, which matches up rows from two relations that have a common value. And then group, which gives us, you know, nested bags, and flatten, which is just the inverse of groups. Uh, this is not the only way that I could have picked my core um, operations in PIG. There are a lot of other relations in the PIG language that I didn't tell you about. Um, there are some for input and output. There's some for interfacing PIG with other code. You know, this is a re very real-world language. But there are other operations that 
um, are that are or could be derived from the core operations. Uh, cross, co-group, and distinct are some of them. Um, and if you want, and let me focus in on one of those for right now. Uh, the cross operation will take uh, two relations and create the complete Cartesian product of them. It will match every tuple in the first relation to every tuple in the second relation. So in the code that I've got here, the size of all pairs will be the number of rows in A times the number of rows in B. So a very large data set is generated there. Um, and if you wanted, you could remove join from my list of core operations and replace it with cross. And then you can affect the function of join by doing a cross product between the two relations and then just filtering out all rows where the two values don't match. Uh, I choose to keep join as my core operation because cross is very inefficient. There's a huge uh, data set that gets outputted in general. But in an abstract mathematical sense, you could pick either one. And in fact, the original formulation of relational algebra focused more on cross than join. Similarly, you could affect a cross product using, uh, using a join and a for each generate, but uh, it's a little more complicated. Uh, the distinct operator removes all duplicate uh, tuples from a relation, and, it's, and distinct is built into the, into the language, but if you wanted, you could get the same effect by doing a group and uh, uh, then a for each generate. So now let's kind of back, so that's the core of the pig language. Um, there's other stuff to make it more real world, but that's the core logic of it. Now let's sort of back up from the keyboard, as it were, and go up to the chalkboard of formal mathematical theory. Now, first of all, why would we want to do that? I mean, we know the pig language at this point, and we can go solve problems with it. Um, yes, we can, but understanding core relational algebra is a good way to really solidify uh, your understanding of how the logic, of how the programming paradigm works. Uh, there are ways that relational algebra is different from pig. There are ways that it's similar, and it really pays to understand that relationship to ground yourself in what is essential and what's non-essential to programming, to relational programming. Um, the second reason is if you ever want to you know, write a relational programming language, uh, you're going to have to understand the mathematical side of it in order to write optimized queries. So a good way to think about relational algebra, how it relates to the pig language, it's sort of like lambda calculus relating to Lisp and Haskell. Uh, it's an idealized theory that needs to be made real world in order to be used. So first off, what's an algebra? Uh, an algebra is one of these you know, fancy mathematical terms for something that's actually just embarrassingly simple. There's two things that go into an algebra. Uh, the first ingredient is a set of things. They can be whatever you want. And the second ingredient is some operations that take in things in your set and spit out other things in your set. Um, a simple example of that is integers with arithmetic. Your, uh, your underlying set is the integers, negative 10 a million, zero, one. We're not having fractions or real numbers in here for now. Uh, the set can be infinite. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> that's fine. And the operations that we have are the ones from basic arithmetic. You know, plus, minus, times. Those all take in two integers and output a single integer. You can have a unary operation, too, that takes in only one integer. 
uh, the negation as an example. Um, <clears throat> when we put in you know two and three to the five to the plus operator, we get out five. Seven into the uh, negation into the negation operator gives us negative seven. And again, this is all mapping from integers to integers. So now, what's relational algebra? Well, not surprisingly, the underlying set is going to be the set of you know all relations. Relations in the context of relational algebra are slightly different from in the context of pig. I'll get into that in a second. And you know the operations in place of plus and uh, negation, you have things like you saw in pig, joins and merges and filters. So the underlying sets here, the underlying set here is the set of all relations. Uh, they are obviously much more complicated than the integers, but they serve this, they fill the same role in the algebraic structure. But as I mentioned, they're different from the relations in pig. The key difference is that in pig, you can have duplicate rows. It's not a problem. But in relational algebra, a relation is really seen as uh, a set. In particular, it is a subset of the set of all possible tuples that have the right schema. So, for example, uh, if you want to look at this geometrically, you can say you've got a two column relation. You can enumerate all the possible values for the first column along the x axis. It's easy if they're integers, but you could also enumerate them if they're strings. Uh, and you enumerate all possible values for the um, second column along the y axis. And then a relation is just some subset of this lattice. And there are, and there's no room for duplicates there. It's just draw a circle around the points. And for a relation with more columns to it, say a, a five column relation, you'd be in five dimensional you know, space, pseudo space, because you know, whatever you want to call it, it's a five dimensional lattice. And a lot and the core operations are largely set based, because again, this is sets. You can do unions and intersections, complements, Cartesian products. Uh, the unions, again, have to be um, compatible schemas, though. The operators that are purely relational uh, are things much like what we saw at, um, in PIG. You've got the select, the select operator, sigma, which lets you uh, select out certain rows of relation. You can do a uh, join or a cross product. The pi here is the projection operator, which is basic, which is a lot like the 4-H generate. Um, and then you've got the row here, the renaming operation, which doesn't change the data at all, just lets you change the schema. And again, there's other operators here, but these are you know, some of the core ones, and you can see that they are analogous to pig. I'd like to, I'd like to spend a little bit of time dwelling on the projection operator. Um, Think back, I'd like to motivate it using um, projection in real physical three-dimensional space. Let's say you've got a three-dimensional object and you use a light to you know, cast a shadow, i.e. to project it down onto two dimensions. Um, if you impose coordinates on the system like this, you can see that what you're really just doing is squashing down or removing the z dimension. Um, if you wanted to instead be projecting a three, 
if you wanted to look at this three-dimensional object as a set of you know points with coordinates, you're basically stripping off the z dimension and forcing everything down into the xy plane. And note that your original relation might have had some tuples that only vary in the z column. Those two those tuples will project down into the same uh, point on the xy. In this, this, they'll project down to the same tuple in your output. And because a relation always has to be a set with distinct elements, we can actually remove rows by doing this projection. It's in the same way that uh, if I block the light with my hand to create a shadow and then block my hand with my other hand, it's still going to be the same shadow. So now let's back up for a second. I'd like to show you a different way to envision what relations are and how they operate. Relational algebra is very closely related to first order logic. And the original formulation was, uh, it really looked at relational algebra as sort of a logical deduction engine, less the, more so than you know, data processing. The key paradigm here is to see that a relation is basically a logical predicate. And if I have a relation that says, you know, who is uh, the father of a child, who's the mother of a child, this relation just really corresponds to, the, the tuples in this relation really just correspond to actors about whom this predicate is true saying that Tywin Cometerian is in the father-child relation is the same as saying that the father of predicate is true of Tywin and Tyrion. And this sort of list of true entries for a predicate is called the extension of a predicate. And operations that we might want to do in logic really correspond to relational operations. So for example, if we want to find people who had a child together, um, the way we would compute that is we would do a join of these two relations uh, and then project them out, uh, stripping away the child column. And in logical notation at the beginning, uh, a father and mother had a child together if there exists some child such that uh, F is the father of it, and M is the mother of it. So th these logical operations really correspond to uh, operators in relational algebra. And here's a, a table that gives some of the uh, comparisons. Um, you know, Tywin and Tyrion will be, if, if we do a union, it's the same as a logical or. Uh, if you've got a relation C that is the union of A and B, um, something, the predicate C will be, will be true of an actor if it was, if the predicate A was true of it or the predicate B was true of it. Uh, taking the set difference of two of these relations is like negation and, and so on, the analogy continues. And there's one, there were a couple things that were conspicuously, that were missing from relational algebra as I presented it to you that are truly missing in the original, in the original relational algebra as laid out by Cod. You know, I mentioned the ability to, gen to uh, have duplicates, but the big ones are, note, there was no grouping, there was no flattening, and we couldn't make new columns with the the projection only takes away columns. There's no way to generate new ones. Those might seem like glaring flaws, but this relation, this logical view of relations helps illuminate why that might be the case. Remember, if, to motivate why group wouldn't be there, remember every tuple in a relation is you know, some actors about which this predicate is true. 
Well, if one of the entries in a tuple is a bag of, you know, of, of other tuples, what does that mean logically? It's not saying that some person is the father of another person. Uh, if anything, it would be making a statement about another predicate, which is not something you do in first order logic. It's really not sensible. Uh, and flatten in the same way would only apply if you're already starting with this you know, perverse kind of relation that doesn't jive with logical interpretation. And you can't generate new columns because you know, you're trying to you know, derive facts about the actors who are already present you know, in your uh, database. You're not trying to generate new actors. Relational algebra is a way to ask questions about the people or objects or whatever they are that are currently described in your database. Um, relational algebra has a lot to recommend it. I'm a big fan of pig and people use SQL all the time, but it's worth bearing in mind that it is limited in certain fundamental ways. Uh, the biggest, you know, glaring lack is that it's not Turing complete. At least, you know, core relational algebra isn't. You can sometimes hack certain implementations, but generally it's not Turing complete. And the easiest way to see that is the halting problem. You know, it is a classical theorem that if you've got a Turing complete language and you write a program in it, it is not decidable whether that program will halt. But in a piece of relational code, you've got a finite number of operators, um, and each one will and each one is guaranteed to terminate. And at the end, your overall computation comes to a halt. So there's got to be something missing from relational algebra. Now here's a real problem that it that it can't solve, and it's a problem you might actually want to solve. Say you've got um, a, an input that is a table of parents and children, and you want to output um, an ancestor relations. So if Bob is present in the table, you don't want to just have Bob and his children present in the output, you want to have Bob and all of his descendants, no matter how many generations down they are in the output. The theoretical name for this um, operation is called a transitive closure. Intuitively, the way you'd want to do this is, well, if you join the parent's um, relation against itself, you can calculate the grandkids. And then do it again, you can calculate the great-grandkids. You should do this um, constantly adding any new ancestor relationships that have been described uh, to your ancestors relation. And do this until there are no more ancestors to find. Until you, you know, do this until you have traced Adam down through all of the generations that you have uh, records of progeny for. Uh, the problem is loops aren't allowed. You know, there there is no concept of a do something until some criterion is met in Pig. And if you look, if you want to look at this logically, we can see that you know, an ancestor that um, an ancestor that someone is the ancestor of somebody else if either they're the parent or if they're the parent of you know somebody else and that somebody else is an ancestor of uh, the far down descendant so if, when you try to spec out this ancestor predicate uh, you find that it is defined recursively and recursion is not allowed in uh, relational algebra. Looping and recursion are the same thing. Uh, looping is what it looks like in um, an imperative language. Recursion is in logic and functional languages. But they, they add the same thing. And this is the missing ingredient. It's why relational algebra is um, not Turing complete. So on the one hand, there are fundamental limitations to what it can do. 
On the other hand, you know, what that uh, deficiency buys us is we know that our queries will terminate, and really a lot of the times that you, a lot of the things that you could do with a Turing complete language, maybe you shouldn't be doing with um, you know large data sets, the kind of situations that you would be using um, something like SQL or PIG. The transitive closure, for example, um, that relation can be quadratic in size, and if you've got a million rows in your data in your um, data set, are, are you sure you want to risk that? It's sort of like the cross operation that I mentioned earlier. Um, you shouldn't do that unless you really, really mean it. So now let's look at some of the at the relationship between pig and pure relational algebra. Cod had um, certain biases when he put together his original formulation. Um, he thought that data should all be very well structured um, from the get-go. He saw relations more as a tool for answering one question. Um, he thought that your schemas should all be defined up front, and again he viewed relations as sets. Well, PIG is designed to handle um, all kinds of structures of data. Uh, you're, you don't have to have it be uh, all normalized uh, from the get-go. And this allows us to be a lot more flexible with things like uh, groups and co-groups in PIG. Um, he saw relations as you know, a way to answer one question. But PIG is a data flow language where you can, in general, have many different outputs. Uh, for COD, it was sort of like you do all these operations and it boils down to one final operation. But in PIG, it's more of um, uh, a directed acyclic graph, a dependency graph of the between the different relations you define. And any number of them can be outputs. Uh, another difference is PIG, like most big data systems, or at least a lot of big data systems, does not really presuppose much about the structure of your data. This is why we had to declare the schema when we first loaded the data in. In real world, in real world applications, you often don't know whether the fifth column is an integer or something, or you don't want to impose structure. Uh, right up front. You can figure out what to do with the data later. And finally I mentioned the uh, problem of duplicates. So now let's get into some of the nuts and bolts of what this looks like in the real world. Um, I mentioned PIG runs on large clusters of computers, in particular the uh, Hadoop platform is the way it's implemented. It's very, very different under the hood from something like SQL. And there are other relational languages out there that are different from both of them. So this is just one example. Um, first, I'd like to start with a little bit of a primer on MapReduce. Um, Hadoop is uh, the open source implementation of the sort of MapReduce programming paradigm that was originally put together by Google. In a MapReduce job, a single MapReduce job, you have two parts. There's the mapper and the reducer. Uh, the mapper is a function that takes in a piece of your input data and outputs a list of key value pairs. And the reducer takes in uh, all of the key value pairs for one unique key and then outputs you know, the, the final output of the MapReduce job. So the classic example is word count. Um, you can have several instances of the mapper. Each one uh, takes in a chunk of text and outputs um, the number of occurrences of a word in its part of the text. And the reduce processes 
then you have one for each unique word seen, and the reduce process will just add up the values observed. And the way this looks on a computer, you know, because again, this is a cluster of computers we've got here. Uh, the mapper will, pro each node in the cluster will run a mapper on the data that it has. Uh, there's no communication between the cluster, between the nodes in the cluster. It's only when we get to the reduce stage that they will route the emitted key value pairs to the appropriate uh, reduce instance. And so when you're trying to write map reduce jobs, there's several things you want to do to uh, maintain performance. Uh, you want to put as much of the logic as you can into the mapper, um, and then you want to try to minimize network congestion by emitting as few key value pairs as possible, and you don't want to have stragglers among the reduces. So now, going back to pig and how pig is done on Hadoop, um, relations are the way relations are stored is the different each a particular tuple in a relation will be on one node in the cluster but in general the rows for a relation can be uh, distributed very broadly across the nodes in a cluster um, everything is stored as ascii um, and the rows are just broken up into files um, and I'll take a second here to show you why having duplicate rows makes a lot of sense. If your relation is spread across many different nodes in the cluster, it would be extremely difficult and require coordination between the nodes to even check whether there was a duplicate row. So for efficiency's sake, it makes a lot of sense to uh, allow duplication of rows in PIG. Um, in contrast to the way pig stores relations, um, other systems might store one particular column, might, might break it according to columns. So the first several columns in a relation might all be stored on a particular node, and the rest of the columns might be stored in another node. This, has, this is done for efficiency reasons. For example, if one of the columns is an integer, then you know that every entry in that column is going to be the same size. And that's great from the perspective of trying to write very highly optimized queries. You see a lot of this kind of stuff in SQL. Uh, Pig suffers from the fact that because your tuples can contain anything, um, you don't know going into it what pieces of data are where. On the other hand, PIG lets you be a lot more flexible about what data you actually operate on. Um, when you run a PIG job, it gets compiled into a series of these MapReduce jobs. Uh, and, you can under, and you can go back to the operations in PIG and look at how those turn into mappers or reducers. Um, the for each generate and the filter, which generally will operate on just one row in a tuple and output another row in a tuple, or maybe no rows if you're doing a filter, or maybe several rows if you're doing a flatten, but it takes in just one row. You can combine those into one mapper. So even if you, so even if you have a for each generate in your pig code, and then you filter that relation, when you run the pig code, uh, those will probably be merged into one map into one MapReduce job. Other operators don't fit into a mapper. If you're doing a join or a group by, those require that you coordinate data across that, that, that you coordinate pieces of data that could be stored across the different nodes in the cluster. And the only way you can do that is in the reduce stage of the MapReduce job. Um, to give you, now he, I mentioned that cross is one of the operators that's built into the pig language. Um, the way that works 
to give you one instant, one example of how this is implemented, uh, all of the data that is in relation A and relation B will get sent to the same uh, reduce process. And once that reduce process has all those data loaded, it will then do a Cartesian product and emit all of the different pairs. So you can see why that's very inefficient. Um, one of the whole points of optimizing MapReduce is you want to avoid stragglers, and there's just one reduce instance. Um, the next operator, the join. If you're joining A by foo and B by bar, um, pretty naturally, you treat the foo column for relation A as its as, as its key, and you'll output the key value pairs that are the foo entry and then the row and the relation. Similarly for B, you will output pairs that are the bar entry and then the row and the relation. And there's a different uh, reducer for each of the different values. So what you'll end up with after this join is the relation C will be distributed across the different nodes in the cluster. And each node will have um, the pieces of C that correspond to the values for foo and bar that it was processing. There are other kinds of joins available in PIG, uh, which you can which you can use if you know something about your data to make it a little bit more optimized. Uh, the simplest is uh, a replicated join or a map side join. This is used if one of your data sets is a lot smaller than the other. You know, if data set A is going to be five lines and data set B is going to be, you know, thousands, it's going to be more efficient to just copy A in its entirety over to every node in the cluster that has rows in B, uh, and then have each node in the cluster with those rows in B join A against its rows. Um, if you and by doing this, you really minimize uh, network traffic. Uh, the other specialized join that you can do in Pig is called a skewed join. Sometimes the column A, the column foo in A, might be overwhelmingly one value rather than others. If there's a million different rows in A, and you know, all but 10 of them uh, have the value 1 and the others have something else, then you're going to get, and you do a default join, you're going to get a straggling reduce process. The poor reducer that gets this, you know, mammoth value is going to have thousands and thousands of rows to iterate over, whereas every other map, whereas every other instance of the reduce, every other reducer will be done very quickly. So if you do a skewed join, PIG will sample your data set A to see what are these overwhelmingly popular values. And it will spawn several different reduce instances uh, for each one of those so that you get more parallelism in uh, the join. So I've covered a lot of ground here, as I said, and it's all been relatively superficial. Um, but I hope that I've given you a flavor for what relational programming is and why it's pretty cool and useful in the world today. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about it, COD's original papers are online, which delve into the mathematical nitty-gritty of it. Uh, the documentation for the pig language is extensive. Uh, it's a very popular language, so there's a lot out there on it. Um, and any database textbook will talk about languages like SQL and how the relational programming is realized in that. So uh, thank you all for your time. Have a great day.